Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining a little bit early. We'll give people just one or two minutes um, to log in before we get started. everyone we have a lot of great content to, to cover today so we'll go ahead and get started as people continue to log in um, but I just wanted to welcome everyone again to today's webinar um, which is the last of the six webinars included in this series designed to help small jurisdictions with their COVID-19 response. Today will be the second installment of the COVID-19 recovery strategies aimed at helping jurisdictions address challenges to their health and child care systems. Before we get started, we just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping items so everybody's aware. Um, <clears throat> everyone is currently muted and will remain muted throughout the duration of the webinar. Um, during the Q&A session at the end, there may be an opportunity to um, raise your hand and be unmuted, but we'll give additional instructions about that closer to the time. Uh, in order to submit any questions you have throughout the presentation, you can use the chat and Q&A functions. Um, Please, if you can, use the chat box to submit any technical issues that you're experiencing, and then use the Q&A to submit questions you have for our panelists. That will just help us keep those organized. Um, and although we will hold all questions until that end, that session at the end, you can always submit throughout the entire presentation, and we'll just save them for that Q&A at the, at the close of the, the webinar. Lastly, I just wanted to remind everybody that we will be making the recording and all of the related materials, including the deck that you see here, available after the webinar on the HUD Exchange website. So just be on the lookout for those materials afterwards. Um, with that, I'll pass things over to Julia Ryan, who's the Vice President of Health Initiatives at LISP, to get us started. Right, take it away, Julia. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Now, for those of you who participated in our first one on this topic a few weeks ago, welcome back. And for newcomers, we're really pleased to have you. As Sarah said, and just as a reminder, this webinar is part of a series that LISC is delivering in collaboration with HUD on topics related to housing and economic development and health in smaller communities in these post-COVID times. This is the second webinar in that health theme, as she's noted. And we've really defined that broadly, including issues related to meeting your community's childcare needs and other social determinant of health needs. And the, in terms of child care, that's so important, particularly for people with less economic resources than others, given its extraordinarily strong tie to all things health, not just physical health and mental health of kids, but also the mental health of their parents and the financial stability of their families, which of course corresponds very much with people's physical, mental, uh, physical and mental health across the lifespan as well. Uh, and Sarah, if you could just advance a slide for me. So for this webinar today, we're responding to a request that we heard from a number of participants last time and some small city representatives in the interim that you're really hungry for real world examples of how smaller jurisdictions are addressing cross-cutting child care and social determinant of health needs in these times. You've also noted that the landscape is changing so rapidly, which of course we all recognize. So we're going to start today with an update on some resources that you might want to be aware of, current or forthcoming. Uh, that will be delivered by my colleague Nicole Barcliff on LISC's policy team. And then we're going to hear from experts from Rhode Island's Department of Human Services, 
who have responded to COVID by leveraging systems and relationships for cross-departmental coordination and creatively blended and braided funds to respond to COVID in the many small jurisdictions that make up the state of Rhode Island. So I think you'll find their expertise very valuable and rich, and we really appreciate them joining us. Uh, Sarah, if you could just jump forward a slide. Here you'll see our lineup for today's uh, session. Oh, I'm sorry, one more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you'll hear more about the backgrounds of all of our speakers, um, but as I said, we're so grateful for their input. I'll also just ho uh, highlight that the session today wouldn't uh, be possible without the expertise of the LISC team, Cindy Larson and Shai Loros, who you'll hear from sharing their knowledge about other jurisdictions, trends, and experiences as we go about the discussion today. Uh, so one more slide forward, please. Just two last notes before I turn it over to Nicole. Um, first, the slide deck for the last webinar in this series was just chock full of resources and links about health-related and childcare-related funding streams, places to access data that may help you in accessing those funding streams, and more. So just a reminder that you can find those slides on the HUD Exchange referenced here. And second, talk to us. You know, Sarah said it, please do write your questions in the Q&A box uh, throughout the session today. If we don't answer you right away, it might be that the content is soon to be covered in the presentations. Um, but if at the end, if we've missed something, we will be raising those questions and looking to respond to you. Time permitting, there will also be an opportunity at the end of the session to raise your hand, so to speak, in the platform here and you'll be invited to unmute to voice a question or a comment with audio, not just in the, the written Q&A. So without further ado, Sarah, you can move the slide forward and I'll turn it over to Nicole, Policy Director at LISC, uh, who's been so attentive and such a good leader on all things relevant to social determinants of health in these times. And Nicole, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Julia, um, and I'm pleased to be joining you all today. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief overview of uh, that gives you kind of a snapshot of where federal investments currently are um, with respect to funding for uh, child care uh, providers um, and also um, how localities and states um, have been uh, basically addressing uh, their child care uh, needs. Next slide. So um, this slide uh, or this information may look familiar to many of you um, and much of the information that's come out over the past few months, um, there's been a lot of focus on federal resources dedicated for child care. And so the predominant uh, funding me mechanism for child care comes from the Child Care Development Block Grant, which is a federal program um, that is allocated to states and then dollars actually go out of the door uh, based upon the state plan and then is dispersed throughout states um, and localities based upon um, the number of low income um, or um, at need um, child care uh, families. So CCDBG was funded at $3.5 billion in CARES Act. Um, that is the total amount of supplemental or emergency response funding that has gone to the child care sector. Um, we'll go to, uh, when we get to the next slide, not yet, but uh, you'll see kind of an, uh, we can go back. <laughs> Well, you'll see an allocation and a spread that includes resources beyond CCDBG, but in terms of the main funding source that goes out to support all 50 states um, and territories, um, this is this is it. Um, and so as talks have um, been going on about the next infusion of resources federally to help support the child care industry, um, there are uh, varying proposals from both the House and the Senate. Um, and so before we get to the next funding um, agreement, there will have to be some sort of reconciliation or agreement upon the actual level. So you'll see that we have about 15, um, 15, uh, it's actually billion, $15 billion proposed, $15 million proposed from the Senate, which is $5 million for the Child Care Development Block Grant as it currently exists, and then a newer allocation of $10 million for back to work child care um, grants that would be allocated in a manner that is uh, directly either to providers or through different mechanisms um, than currently exist through CCDBG. So this is a newer administration of resources that um, actually garners greater flexibility than what was proposed in um, CCDBG. 
um, the House proposal as it currently exists. Um, this is a bill that has actually passed the House on the HEROES Act for supplemental funding, provides $7 million for CCDBG. Okay, next slide. And so, in addition to, because if you look at those dollars in comparison to other sectors and what has been provided for a coronavirus, a coronavirus pandemic response, um, the child care industry has received sufficiently less funding than some others of the, of the other sectors. And as such, um, you see states and localities that are looking towards, in addition to the proposed supplemental or um, emergency response dollars that will come out in the next round. Um, there are several other proposals that are at play trying to directly allocate resources to child care providers and states to help them meet their child care emergency needs. So several of these um, pieces of legislation um, that are um, pending are the Child Care's Infrastructure Act, which for us is particularly notable because it actually allocates dollars for a state grant program related to child care infrastructure. So basically resourcing providers through um, and intermediaries with direct resources to meet the facilities needs associated with child care. Um, and then there are, um, it's all that provision for infrastructure is included um, in the Child Care for Economic Recovery Act, but that is a broader bill that includes both tax incentives and direct funding um, to stabilize the child care sector. Um, the Child Care Assistance is Essential Act is another $50 billion proposal for child care. So as you can see, there's a lot of discussion about how to um, basically direct additional resources from the federal level um, down to states and then into localities to support child care providers um, and, and local entities. Um, and so one of the things that we would highlight um, for folks to start to think about is as these dollars pass through, particularly through a health lens, being sure that the resources that are provided allow providers to um, address their facilities and infrastructure needs in addition to basic provision of services for um, families, essential workers, et cetera. Next slide. So this is a list um, of total child care resources that were provided through CHIP CARES Act. I only highlighted here um, for you to see direct dollars that are allowable either um, to, to basically to families to help pay for the cost of child care, so flexibility um, for the resources to be used for um, direct care for providers, and then um, some resources that uh, are direct uh, child care funding streams. So you'll see the initial investment for the Child Care Development Block Grant here. You see a Head Start investment for you guys um, who are probably familiar, Head Start is directly federal to local resources. It's outside of um, the child care network, but a lot of providers um, in different places could serve Head Start in um, CCDBG or child care um, families. Um, and then you have um, these additional resources that like the Community Development Block Grant, while explicitly not utilized, for child care on faith, um, while explicitly not designated for child care use, an allowable use, particularly called out under care that funding and a, um, for pandemic response, was to support child care centers. Um, not actually called out on this, but you may recall from further from uh, previous presentations, our uh, child care providers were actually also um, eligible for all of the supports that were provided to small business owners, so the PPP program, um, the payroll protection uh, program, and other small business supports in addition to Department of Labor programs um, that included unemployment insurance, et cetera. Those are all resources that were not explicitly called out for child care providers, but were available to them. Um, and I won't go into a great deal. We'll probably get to this in discussion about the take up of those resources and how that as affected the stabilization of the sector, um, but you know, didn't call them out here because they're not exclusive um, child care funding streams. You can go next slide. So here are, um, the, uh, this is really an articulation of the, the major um, sources of CARES Act funding that states and localities um, have, in addition to the CCDBG dollars, may be using um, to help direct um, resources towards the child care sector. So basically, um, the Public Housing Operating Fund, 
um, allowed um, for uh, channeling of activity support to support education and child care for Im impacted families. So basically to cover the cost of care, Head Start, like I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, the other piece that was really, um, I think that states have come up with interesting um, ways and, and locality, interesting ways to leverage resources are through the state and local preparedness grants through um, HHS. So basically, this was a very flexible funding stream um, that basically allow uh, states um, and local um, entities to develop uh, pandemic response activities um, and entities that were really thoughtful about how to braid, blend, and channel those resources um, actually use them in, uh, via a child care lens. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, so these are kind of what I highlighted um, top line level um, for, um, for as allowable uses uh, under the CARES Act, um, CARES Act funding um, around CCDBG, but also CDBG. Next slide. So here is, um, I think, what a lot of people haven't um, necessarily been thinking about with respect to directed federal resources, is that in addition to pandemic response dollars that have come out as either quote unquote stimulus or supplemental forms of funding, you still have the normal um, appropriations process that actually funds the government through the next fiscal year. And so um, on July 31st, um, we're we basically we're still in negotiations for the next next fiscal year of funding for the federal government, which of course, of course also includes the allocation of resources towards the child care and early learning sector. One of the interesting provisions outside of direct resourcing for like say the child care development block grant or Head Start or preschool development grants, those things that were included that are explicitly child care on the health side is uh, language that's included in the House um, Appropriations Bill that uh, funds social determinants of health. And so there is a pending piece of legislation called the Social Determinants of Health um, Accelerator Act. And basically it allows states to develop plans um, that and pull in uh, relevant entities across the state agencies, but also um, community partners if they see fit um, to develop a plan to identify the major social determinants of health that they would want to address and then develop a strategy um, with all of those key players at the table to kind of come up with a plan to address them. Now, the, these resources don't um, include direct funding for implementation of the plan, but it's for a planning process and for the, the planning of an implementation process. So not funding direct, direct service or infrastructure investments really funding cross-agency um, and cross-sector collaboration to address major um, issues. We see this um, if it is taken up um, in a manner that is timely um, and agreed upon by Congress as a huge opportunity for child care entities throughout the state um, to, to really, or, um, and um, government entities that are interested in having child care being a meaningful part of the conversation around health outcomes for uh, local communities. Um, to include uh, child care sector voices um, and child care agency voices in, in the planning process around social determinants of health. Um, and so this plan would provide $10 million um, and it will come through CDC. Um, and while, again, while it doesn't include direct investments in social determinants of health, it's a real opportunity to incorporate child, child care into that planning. Next. So this notion um, that, and this is more along the lines of kind of just reinforcing what uh, the social determinants of health uh, accelerate, uh, accelerator act does. It's basically you help states and local communities develop better strategies um, and to leverage authorities for programming around social determinants. And then basically uh, the, these planning grants, actual seed money to have people come around the table um, to identify um, to identify the issues and to develop strategies to, in order to address them. And so there's a lot bubbling at the federal level um, around child care uh, direct investment um, for the stability of the sector, but also potentially an opportunity to shift the conversation um, to see how child care directly impacts health um, and aligns with what states and localities see as primary outcomes, positive outcomes for the communities that they serve. 
Um, there are lots of opportunities, I think, with dollars coming through for entities to, and states and localities to rethink how they see uh, child care and to break down different silos. And I think that uh, the state that you're about to hear about next is a really good example of how, um, with additional resources coming, potentially coming down the bike pipe federally, um, options that uh, smaller localities and communities might want to take. So I'm going to turn this over to Cindy now to talk a little bit about um, Rhode Island. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a great introduction and some framing of um, sort of the many resources and many proposals for resources that are floating around that municipalities should have their eye on um, as those begin to flow through states. So, um, Cindy Larson, I'm LIST's National Director of Child Care and Early Learning. For those of you who participated in our first webinar, um, you heard me talk a little bit about what we're seeing across the country. And I do have the opportunity in my job to um, really see in a very deep way how many states, cities, and towns are deploying their resources, thinking about um, child care and health issues. And, you know, as I thought about what's a place that we could really focus on and dive into, um, Rhode Island came to mind, not only because that is where I live, um, but also because of some of the real uniqueness um, of the state in a number of ways. And I want to highlight a couple of those before I turn it over um, to the main speakers today. So for those of you who are not familiar with Rhode Island, um, it is a very small state. The population of the entire state is around 1 million. Um, and in that small state, there are 39 distinct municipalities, all who have their own governing structures. Um, so as you can imagine, even for state leaders, they become very engaged in, um, in municipalities and in working with them and ensuring that resources are flowing correctly. The economy of the state is highly dependent on tourism and hospitality. And so something like a pandemic where you're thinking about borders um, becomes really very heightened in that type of a place. Um, on a positive note, though, this is a state that has really relied very heavily on partnerships um, and on thinking very creatively in order to move things forward. Um, and so with that framing, I am really delighted to be able to introduce to you today um, two folks who are real movers and shakers here in the state of Rhode Island, Director Courtney Hawkins. Um, who was appointed to her position as the director of the Rhode Island Department of Human Services by Governor Gina Raimondo in 2017, and Caitlin Molina, who is the assistant director of the Department of Human Services, um, who for the last few years has primarily overseen um, all of the child care operations in addition to, to being involved in some other key activities at the department. Um, both of these folks have been truly transformative in their leadership of a department that um, was really in need of transformation, transformation and um, of a child care system as well that had um, lots of strengths, but many needs to build on in terms of quality and access and streamlining things, particularly in thinking about how families and providers interact with the department. So. Um, I'm excited to have the two of them talk to you a little bit more about that work and about how that work has provided a really strong platform to build off of during the pandemic. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to them. Um, and if you can click to the next slide, we'll kick it off. Great, thank you, Cindy. This is uh, Courtney Hawkins uh, from Rhode Island DHS. I appreciate that generous introduction. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, I'm joined by Caitlin Molina from my team and also Alicia Pino, who is our Chief Information Officer and who put together uh, these slides for today. And I want to acknowledge uh, the hard work that she did to uh, get us here. So thank you all for having us. If, I think if you click off into the introduction, um, you're going to hear from me and from Caitlin, two passionate um, state public servants, also moms of young children. Uh, so if you hear yelling or screaming during this webinar, we uh, thank you in advance for your patience. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, what we're calling our whole family and all-in approach. 
Um, and what I'm most proud of is that much of the groundwork that we had laid in the years uh, since Caitlin and I joined the department, I think really um, helped DHS and other state agencies work together to provide what we call a whole family approach in our COVID response. And we're going to talk to you a little bit um, about the agency in general and then some of the, our specific um, strategies in responding to this pandemic, to, uh, you know, up until now and, and which we all know continues um, to be our primary focus day to day. So if you click through to the next slide, we're going to talk about, um, again, some background on the agency, some background on our COVID response. I'm going to specifically talk about what we did to try to strengthen our response to ensure that Rhode Islanders' basic needs were met in areas of food security, cash assistance, um, distribution of PPE, et cetera. And then I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin, who's going to um, do more of a deep dive into our child care response. So the mission of DHS broadly um, is to ensure that all Rhode Islanders have the opportunity to thrive at home, working in the community. Um, our agency is responsible for the administration of public benefits across the state, um, and we serve about 300,000 Rhode Islanders a year, which is about a third of our population. And this includes everything from the administration of the state's Medicaid program to our SNAP program, child care assistance. Um, we also uh, rehabilitative services and child support. Um, as uh, Cindy mentioned, while we had always administered the state's child care program last fall, uh, the state's child care licensing unit was transferred to our department. Um, this was something that Caitlin and I really wanted to do so that we could tie the payment for child care with the, and with the work around quality and licensing, and we did not know that we would then be taking on the responsibility of licensing um, and regulating a system during a pandemic. Uh, so it has been a, a real challenge, uh, but uh, I think has has given us some great opportunity to strengthen the state's child care program, um, and I've been extremely proud of our response there. So this uh, takes you through um, just a little bit of background around our approach to, oper to operations in our department. Um, on the left side, it talks about this idea of a whole family approach. Um, we've been fortunate over the past couple of years to be working with all the New England states and the Administration for Children and Families on thinking about ways that we can expand our programs to take um, this kind of whole family approach. Instead of seeing the person or the child that we are serving in, in a moment as just that person or child, to think about the full needs of that family and how we can connect to them to wrap around resources that will help them make economic progress. At the same time, we've been thinking about ways we could administer programs in our department with a focus on customer service. And so on the right side, um, it takes you through our key principles that we use in making all decisions and that we've held on to through the pandemic to, to ensure that we're not losing our focus on customer service and continuous improvement. So we call this our blueprint. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, when, when we joined the department, um, we had just implemented an integrated eligibility system that had gone wrong. We had people waiting sometimes three or four hours outside to, uh, to speak to someone or to access services. So we've been really focused on not going back. We've made tremendous progress over the past three years and wanted to be sure that the decisions that we make during this time don't sacrifice that progress and, and um, really have been hoping that we are able to try some new things that might actually make us stronger in the long term. So um, in terms of our collab, Cindy asked us to think a, a little bit about how we've collaborated through COVID-19. And I'll say one thing that has been really helpful about uh, the way our government is structured in Rhode Island is that um, all of the health and human service agencies are part of the secretariat, um, which allows us to, uh, I think, collaborate, collaborate um, more effectively and to think about our shared goals. And we certainly did that through our COVID response. Um, so the first area I would highlight is um, how lucky we are that our Department of Health had um, years ago established and funded what we call the health equity zones. Um, these are community-led uh, backbone organizations in our most vulnerable communities 
that work to uh, address social determinants of health um, in the interest of improving public health across the state. Um, these health equity zones have been really critical to our COVID response. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. But uh, I think as as new funding is, is available, um, it, one of my recommendations to anyone who's interested would be to think about replicating this kind of um, backbone structure in communities, because it is an example where we were um, set up for success, even despite these challenging circumstances. Um, our governor also uh, really pushed us to bring a whole government approach to the pandemic, and uh, we set up about a dozen what we called work streams that brought together leaders from across government to think about how we were responding um, to, to COVID-19. Um, and it was everything from um, quarantine and isolation supports to um, thinking about how we were moving through phases and how those affected each of our different respective um, service areas, um, thinking about how we were testing and reaching people comprehensively. Um, and we continue to operate in this fashion and, and we are fortunate to have a governor that is plugged in at the level of detail um, of the kinds of things I just described um, and a, a team that has been led by our Department of Health but has included our Commerce Department, um, certainly DHS um, and other departments across the state or Department of Education to make sure that we were looking at families as a whole family and making decisions to benefit all members of those families. Lastly, um, the governor convened what we call an equity council, which is led by our Secretary of Health and Human Services, Wilma Jetta Jones. And the, the goal of convening that council was to ensure that our response was, in fact, equitable. We saw that COVID-19, like in lots of places, was disproportionately affecting people of color in high-density communities. And we brought leaders from those communities together to help inform our response to ensure that we were over um, investing to try to combat some of those inequities. So, for example, that council has been instrumental in helping us set up testing sites that would reach people that weren't engaging in our um, uh, community testing sites to date. Um, they've been helping us think about how we can offer quarantine and isolation supports that people will be able to take advantage of and that are culturally appropriate. A Med Equity Council continues to meet weekly um, and uh, influence all of the work streams to ensure that we're um, meeting the needs of those communities. Um, we've also been focused on data being data driven. Um, Everything that we do is informed by, you know, public health data um, that guides us around our reopening. And so we, like most states, have moved through various phases. And um, we've also used this um, to apply at, to make decisions about our reopening of schools. Um, and so the um, the five benchmarks you see here are an example of how um, we use data to. Um, make decisions about which communities in Rhode Island would be eligible to reopen schools. But if you go to our reopening RI website, you'll see the same kind of data that relates to how we've reopened the economy, um, how we've changed our testing approach, um, and, you know, how every area of our response has been tied to some kind of um, assessment of metric that we um, do routinely and ongoing. And so we did reopen schools last Monday and um, all but all but two cities and towns were eligible for reopening. Um, most of those cities are taking a phased approach, so they're reopening slowly uh, with a goal to have all kids in school at least parts of the week by the middle of October. Um, so in my role, I've been really focused on making sure that people's basic needs are met. And um, this has been extremely challenging. We, we faced a lot of barriers to um, making sure people had access to food, for example, but we had a lot of success um, and have come through and overcome many of those challenges. Um, so the quarantine and isolation team was able to work with cities and towns on distribution of um, meals uh, 
culturally appropriate meals um, in neighborhoods across the city. Um, and we worked in partnership with our United Way 2-on-1 system where people could call and get information about where they could get access to food. Um, and I think especially in the time when um, we were um, mostly shut down across the state, this was extremely critical. Um, we've also distributed PPE through our health equity zones and other partners, churches, um, have looked across the state um, and worked with cities and towns to make sure that people have access to masks and sanitizer and other protective equipment as they need it. Um, and uh, our department has also worked really hard to take advantage of federal waivers where we could um, to increase um, access to, uh, in particular, food access for folks, for families across the state. Um, and so like many states, we increased the amount of SNAP that about half of our households got. Um, we were able to finally get a, a approval on online purchasing. One of our big barriers was that people couldn't order online using their EBT card. And so we did uh, very quickly get an online purchasing pilot approved, and now our uh, SNAP customers have access to Amazon and a few other select retailers where they can order online if, if that's better for them. Um, and lastly, we were the first state in the country to um, pay the, out the pandemic EBT program, which gives families the value of missed school meals. We started that in March, and it gives families roughly $6 per day per child. Uh, for every day that school is closed, and uh, we're grateful that we just got permission to provide one more month of benefits for the month of September before that program does expire. Um, and we're hopeful that Congress will take action to extend it because we know it's been really important that families have access to more food while they have kiddos home. Um, I talked about the culturally appropriate um, food distribution already um, and our work with the Hezes. Um, we, one of our priorities was work, um, was thinking about how we could better serve our undocumented population. Um, I'm grateful our governor raised $3 million uh, privately to create a fund called the We Are One Fund, uh, which provides cash gift cards to undocumented families. And we're distributing those through a network of partners. Um, in the community who have close relationships with these families. Um, we also provided a one-time extra payment to our cash assistance families. Um, nearly 4,000 families received an extra benefit payment, um, knowing that just ha the impact of having kids at home and not in school uh, was really taxing families' budgets. And so we wanted to get more resources and uh, were able to allocate some of our peers' funding to that. Um, and finally, we provided additional uh, a, a, a fund that would provide additional money for um, frontline workers or employers of frontline workers to provide a wage enhancement during this period, trying to get more money out to communities um, and also ensure that these frontline workers were appropriately com uh, compensated. So I'll pause there and uh, turn it over to Caitlin, who will take you through uh, the child care interventions. Hi, everyone. This is Caitlin Molina, Assistant Director of the Department of Human Services. Um, it's a pleasure joining all of you. And as the director referenced, you know, child care, while it's an important infrastructure and foundation for the department, is one of many important benefit programs that we administer through the Department of Human Services. Um, and sort of similar to what the director said, you know, when COVID-19 escalated and we reached community transmission in Rhode Island, um, we really enacted a cross-agency approach to support families um, during the crisis. Um, and so in Rhode Island, a per, a, you know, kind of important context setting for you all, we did mandate closure of all licensed childcare facilities in mid-March in response to COVID-19 transmission. Um, and so what we did, we, we prioritized several different supports for programs and for families during this crisis. And I'm going to walk you through kind of what that reopening um, looks like for families and providers. So the first thing that I wanted to talk you through is how we supported families during COVID-19. And so during the mandated closure, um, we really committed to waiving all family co-pays for the child care assistance program. So in Rhode Island, we subsidize child care for about 10,000 families each month. 
Um, many of those families are responsible for a co-share um, when they are enrolled in a program. We felt like it was important to waive that share during the mandated closure period as they were not actively attending. And we also recognized there was incredible hardship for families um, during this time. Uh, Rhode Island, oh, not quite ready to advance, thanks. We also waived the allowable absence policy for families so that they would not have to worry about how many days their children were missing from care. Um, in order to lose their voucher or lose their spot in child care. Um, we also really worked um, with partners to navigate and support federal policy adjustments to reinstate families who may have lost benefits during the closure period due to either unemployment or another circumstance and make sure that upon reopening our child care system, families had active vouchers. Um, we also took on some work to begin regulating and supporting summer camp providers. So in Rhode Island, not dissimilar from our national context, um, summer camp providers were previously un unregulated um, prior to COVID-19. But given the health and safety concerns, the Department of Human Services worked with um, our Department of Health to begin the work of emergency of issuing emergency regulations and thinking through an application and enforcement process for those operators. And, you know, we approved close to 200 summer camp programs and served more than 19,000 children in those summer camp programs this summer. So when it became time to reopen childcare, there was a really a cross agency effort. We worked with our Department of Health colleagues, we worked with the Department of Ed, and we really streamlined a process for child care programs to reapply to reopen under new emergency regulations. And so we had COVID-19 control plans for child care programs across the state. Um, they were asked to submit staffing plans, floor plans, um, attestation to the new emergency regulations. Um, in order to reopen. We also required that they complete, and I'll speak a little bit more to this on the next slide in a moment, but we required that they participate and complete a variety of professional development offerings that would properly educate the field on health and safety practices and regulatory compliance during COVID-19. Um, we also resourced our providers upon the reopening. So our CCAP provider rate enhancements um, were temporarily adjusted and we're still under those pandemic rates to appropriately subsidize providers to serve children under reduced group sizes, um, given the infection control protocols we have in place, um, and just to accommodate the additional costs associated with PPE and other equipment during the pandemic. Um, we did a lot of distribution of free PPE to our child care programs. Anyone who reopened during the month of June um, received um, free masks and cleaning supplies for their reopening. We've also established and have begun administering grants out of a child care provider relief fund. I'm really excited to say that LISC, our Rhode Island office, partnered in the administration of this fund. And so we are now looking to disperse more than $5 million of grants to child care programs statewide who opened under the new regulations and incurred losses either as a result of occupancy or um, need funds to support small capital improvements to meet the new COVID health and safety regulations. So one of the things that I'm most proud about in Rhode Island, and I think it speaks to the success that we've had in the number of providers who have reopened is, and this data is a little bit dated only because it represents where we were for the initial reopening of June 1st for child care programs. But as you'll see here, we created online professional development learning opportunities for child care providers statewide so that they felt educated and prepared to reopen under the new COVID-19 emergency regulations. Um, so we have about 900 licensed DHS licensed child care programs. Um, you'll note that more than 674 providers participated in these reopening webinars to understand the regulations and health and safety standards. We also documented that close to 4,000 educators and child care staff participated in the reopening webinar, um, which was a requirement. Um, in Rhode Island, our last workforce study um, identifies that we have about 5,000 early childhood workforce members in the state of Rhode Island. So to see that number um, near 4,000 is really remarkable. Um, we also worked with a vendor, our professional development hub, to offer small technical assistance group huddles um, for both family child care and center-based providers who were preparing to reopen. So those technical assistance huddles 
um, really dived in deeply to the reopening framework and helped programs to operationalize the standards and sort of implement new health and safety measures to support reopening. Um, 499 providers participated in that. Um, and 223 were Spanish speaking, um, which represents a huge percentage of our family child care providers in Rhode Island. So this level of engagement around understanding and supporting education for reopening, I think was immensely um, helpful in our success rate in reopening childcare. So what this represents is, you know, we submitted or asked providers to submit a reopening plan in advance of reopening their programs to children and families. Um, and we did this through a phased in approach. Um, initially, the first group sizes were limited to 10 children or fewer. As we saw success with reopening and the low transmission rates of COVID-19, we were able to, able to gradually increase the group sizes of children served in the child care facilities. Um, programs had the option of opening on June 1st or could open later, but the expectation was that by fall, all of our licensed child care providers would be reopened and serving families. Um, so right now we are anticipating 100% um, of our licensed child care programs to be opened by October 1st. Um, currently, as of September 9th, we're at 87%. Um, we have our licensors, and we've done this throughout the summer. I think another piece of success is that we've really mobilized phone banking. Um, so each of our um, licensed child care providers have been receiving basically weekly feedback from either a DHS state employee or um, support from one of our vendors to understand what the challenges are in reopening. Um, so we've not, not really taken a punitive approach for providers who have not yet reopened. We're rather trying to identify what resources of support they need and really creating an asset-based approach to enabling their reopening. Um, so as you'll see, we've gradually increased the percentage of programs who have reopened. Um, all of our age categories are at full capacity as pre-COVID, except for school age, which is still showing a slight reduction in how we're able to enroll. Um, and I would argue that, not argue, but I just want to reiterate too, the programs that have not yet reopened um, operate in public school buildings and have not yet received the approval to do so. And so um, once we have clear um, foresight into how public schools will operate and, and allow outside operators to, you know, create childcare opportunities for before and after care, we will anticipate this being at 100%. Um, so one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is just the child care closures. We know that this has been an issue across the state um, and across the nation. In Rhode Island, we've not seen a lot of child care closures, but I do want to speak to it. Um, you know, we have more than 500 licensed family child care providers in the state of Rhode Island, 22 of whom have reported permanently closing due to COVID-19. Um, and they do this because, and they've indicated that this is because of either retirement or pre-existing underlying health conditions that um, they've chosen to close their programs. We've seen six center-based child care programs close. Um, and, you know, what's important to note about that is that of those six, three have already been purchased and have plans for reopening. Um, so while a lot of states have seen a lot of closures, we are currently not experiencing in that, Rhode, that in Rhode Island. And the chart below also represents the number of new programs that we anticipate bringing online in the coming months. Um, these are providers who have submitted applications, have received site visits, and are prepared to reopen. Um, some of you may have seen this received a lot of national attention. Um, child care in Rhode Island was featured in a CDC study um, just based on limited secondary transmission and what we've experienced so far in childcare in Rhode Island. Um, I credit this to a number of things. I think one, we have a really robust and supportive professional development and technical assistance hub, which properly educated providers on the regulations and how to mitigate risks associated with COVID-19. Um, I would also say that we've resourced providers differently, so they're able to meet the intent of the regulations and are able to implement the regulations with fidelity. Um, and we also have really strong partners at the Department of Health who have instituted daily huddles with DHS to really understand and respond to incidents of COVID-19 in the child care program. Um, so this study really represented the time period of June 1st through July 31st. 
Um, and we had 33 persons who had confirmed cases of COVID-19 in 29 child care programs. Um, and 20 of those child, 29 child care programs only had a single COVID-19 case reported with no apparent secondary transmission. Um, what's also important to know is that five programs of, you know, two to five cases, however, RIDO actually excluded trans, child care related transmission because of the timing of symptom onset. So while there were multiple cases, it was not confirmed that there was actual epi linkage between those cases um, within the child care facility. Um, and that is it. I also just wanted, you know, to raise that we are still conducting unannounced monitoring visits within our DHS licensing unit. Um, we've co we've gotten more than 200 unannounced monitoring visits completed since reopening childcare, and broadly, we are seeing strong compliance to the regulations. I think our childcare system has remarkably rebounded from COVID-19 and have implemented the regulations with considerable fidelity. Um, I'm really proud of the work that our providers have done. I think. You know, the state has certainly supported their response, but the individual providers at the table who have come to us with challenges, but also opportunities have really raised to us the benefit of raising advocacy voice and thinking strategically about cross agency and sort of interagency support to enable success. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for the time today. And, you know, again, thank you to Cindy and the list team for raising Rhode Island as an important example of what we can accomplish. Caitlin and Director Hawkins, thank you so much for that. That was incredibly informative and so much information to take in. Um, Sarah, if you can click to the next slide. I want to kick us right into discussion because um, we have lots to discuss. And I know my list colleagues, uh, particularly the health-focused um, duo we have on of Shai and Julia, will have lots of great questions. But before we dig into that, Caitlin, I just wanted to ask you one follow-up question, if that's okay. So, you know, as I interact with um, everybody from providers to governments at the state, county, and local levels across the country, folks are really concerned about child care and are seeing folks closing down pretty rapidly um, and hearing from providers that as many as half of them may close down. This is gonna have a big impact on communities if they end up with not enough providers. If you were a municipal leader um, on this webinar today that heard you talk about Rhode Island's success in getting providers reopened, what sort of just one big takeaway would you want them to have in terms of if they were gonna to outreach to the state, something they should be, um, you know, asking the state to consider or something they could bring to the table. Does anything in particular come to mind that you want to just follow up on that with? Sure. Um, so I think one opportunity for municipalities to engage thoughtfully is also thinking about facilities and space. Um, our city of Providence has really brought to the table a dynamic group of leaders who have helped us to both identify resources, but also think creatively about how we can expand space offerings for children during the pandemic and licensed childcare. Um, we've seen a lot of difficulties with LEAs and reopening. They are all doing it very successfully, but it's taken a staggered approach. And so really being able to sort of stabilize the school age childcare population within other alternative buildings has been an incredible need and one that um, we've really seen strong municipality leadership from in Rhode Island as we've worked through the pandemic crisis. Great, thank you. Um, Sarah, if you can just, actually you can stay on the slide for now. Shai, um, Shai yes. I'm wondering if you have some things you'd like to raise on. Oh, you know that I'm chopping on the bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, what I wanted to start with um, is almost a, a continuation of your last slide um, because I'm wondering if you could complement what the child care reopening means in the context of work and the workforce and education and school reopenings. Yeah, um, I'm sure my director will want to weigh in here, but I would just say that child care reopening was an incredible moment for the state of Rhode Island because it represented to so many other industries that, yes, we have your back. Also, it is possible. Um, 
you know, we, there were so many concerns prior to reopening. Would staff return? Would families return? What would childcare look like? Um, and I say this as a parent and as a state administrator, there was considerable anxiety about what this was going to look like and what, what would, how would we measure success? Um, and I will say that remarkably in thinking about both the preparation and then afterwards, just the success of reopening, we have been able to learn so much from both our child care providers, their workforce, and from the state response. Um, and it has really been able to lend sort of a blueprint for how we've structured schools reopening, how we've structured other elements of commerce reopening. And we also, um, one thing that I'm particularly proud of, you know, it was never news to me that child care was a, was a public good or that it was a basic need of our, of our Rhode Island constituents. But, you know, so much of reopening Rhode Island's economy was dependent upon the Department of Human Services reopening child care. And it's brought child care to a discussion and a conversation point in a way that it's never been before, both nationally and in state context. And so, it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic for people to appreciate childcare as a basic good and as a basic necessity for not just working, but for, you know, public health, mental health. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but I'm so grateful for it. And I also think we've saw, seen tremendous benefit with, with childcare reopening. There is a public health argument to be made for all of the screening and the, you know, foresight that we now have on children and families that are entering facilities um, and the work that we've done to both educate providers who are in turn educating families on the virus has really been incredible. And it's something that I'm, I'm proud of. Um, I feel like families, constituents, providers, and staff all understand the pandemic in a way that they probably didn't before because of the work that we've done to reopen the system. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that our governor's drive to figure out all of the enabling resources that she could put into effect through us and through our education department to safely open child care education, you know, was a lot about um, making sure that we don't lose sight of all the other health outcomes that are being affected by the pandemic because we're be, if by, you know, that we don't lose sight of those because we're so focused on one health outcome. And she knows that kids and families across the state are struggling and suffering without access to resources and that child care and education are really important. Um, and so we have worked really hard. I think what Caitlin has done and what she described was exactly what needed to happen. We put all of the enablers out there and then asked partners to come to the table. And I don't think there's a better group of partners in the state than our child care community. They have just risen to the occasion. Um, they've taken advantage of the enablers and they've done probably twice as much as I would have expected um, because they know the impact of, of kids and families. Um, on having access to care. So, you know, I am extremely grateful and I think it's a, I think it is right that, that it has solidified the state's child care community as a part of our infrastructure for everyone now in a way that we would have said before and people would have probably not realized. That's really uh, incredible and, and also really inspiring to hear. Um, and if I could just stay on uh, this idea of community engagement. Um, I'm wondering if you could share um, how you found the response of the community. These are um, obviously fraught and challenging times, frankly, frustrating times. And I think that the municipal leaders on the line here today uh, that are part of the this HUD DCTA programming would appreciate hearing how you may have had to respond to either unexpected items that community members voiced as perhaps a strength um, and asked you to do more of uh, that you may not have been prepared to do, um, or perhaps uh, criticism as a result of opening yourself up to the community in newer, bigger ways of engagement with community residents and um, 
how do you check in and know whether or not things are working or not working? I recently spoke with an entity that wasn't quite sure uh, whether or not an initiative was or wasn't working simply because they didn't have enough uptake. Um, so when you talk about, as you mentioned earlier, success measures, um, could you also talk about this and talk about your, your feedback loops? Sure. I think what we have seen is that um, I think this, our response during this time has emphasized that you have to have qualitative and quantitative feedback loops in place to know how you're doing. And so, um, for example, I talked about the disproportionality we, we saw in COVID affecting our communities of color and high density communities. The data showed us that, but our ability to tailor our response to address that finding uh, required us to talk to um, community partners and members of those communities and say, what are we not doing that we need to do? Um, and because we had these community relationships already in place um, through the health equity zones and other kinds of um, partnership groups, we were able to bring people quickly together to say, we're not seeing people testing in the way we want them to. Where can we have testing that will make it more accessible? Um, I would also say, you know, child care is a great example of where our response has changed over time based on feedback. And Caitlin and her team have done an exceptional job of creating regular feedback structures, um, which are frankly sometimes challenging because you hear things you maybe don't want to hear. Um, but it has allowed us to tweak our approach as we've gone along, and it, it is um, strengthened through that process every time. Um, and so we've asked our partners to come to us in the spirit of problem solving and recognized, I think, our approach has, has come with a great deal of humility that we weren't always going to get it right, that there were always going to be mistakes because nobody has done this before and that we really needed people to help us to, to find solutions to things that we weren't getting right. That's great. Um, I want to I want to ask a question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cindy because um, I don't want to hog the mic. But there's something that came up uh, earlier in regards to the whole family approach um, to bring up. Um, could you talk a bit about those that are not in a family? So thinking of individual seniors, uh, elderly and frail, especially that might be isolated, um, and how you've been uh, working to connect them and to address their needs? Yeah, absolutely. We're fortunate that we actually have a, a department in our agency that's part of the Secretariat called the Office of Healthy Aging. And so DHS has worked with that agency over the past six months. They have a lot of community relationships and funding um, streams into the community for things like Meals on Wheels and other kinds of um, programs specifically targeting those populations. And what they needed from us was the ability to access federal waivers to try to improve um, access to services and make um, maintaining of benefits easier for those populations. And so we worked together to do that. The online delivery pilot is one example there. Um, and frankly, it's an example of where we will come out of COVID-19 stronger because we're going to maintain some of these waivers and be able to preserve um, those flexibilities for those populations. Um, they've also done some amazing work around isolation. Um, they actually created a, a program that brought volunteers together to make phone calls for seniors so they could sign up um, for a kind of friendly phone call visit just to have someone check in um, and say hello and see how they're doing. And so they, because we have a, a unique department whose job it is to think about that population all the time, we were able to work with them to be sure they have the resources they need um, to build upon their expertise in their community partnerships to, to ensure we had a strong approach for, for those folks. That's great. Uh, Sarah, can you click ahead a slide? Um, I want to shift a little bit um, to reflecting back on partnerships. So if we can just move ahead one here. 
Um, so Courtney and Caitlin both, um, I heard a lot about partnerships as you we were talking and as you were answering the questions. And I feel like partnerships can be sort of a cliched thing that folks banter about, but it's a very real thing in Rhode Island. So I'm curious why it's been so prioritized in a very intentional way in Rhode Island. Um, you know, the sort of, and I'm talking about partnerships both in terms of the way the state agencies work together, but also in terms of the way that you engage with the community. So, um, you know, I feel like cities and towns across America could learn a lot in terms of how you've been able to prioritize that and in terms of how you've been able to make it a very real thing. Um, so I would love to hear your reflections on that. Thanks, Cindy. I'll start and then invite Caitlin to join in. I think, um, I think, so I have a few thoughts. The first is that our intergovernmental structures, both um, our secretariat, but also our children's cabinet, which is a, a cabinet that was created or kind of re born by our governor um, that brings child serving agencies all together to look at issues specific to children. Both of those structures really have created this culture of interagency collaboration, which I think is really important and would be something that I would encourage cities and towns to think about doing. Um, I think it's very easy in the administration of programs to become focused solely on what your agency does and creating routine structures where people are asking you to step outside of what is just your role and think about a shared outcome across multiple departments has been really important. And in both of those structures, it, it, it allows us to look at how we're working with partners because many of the partners are, you know, we're all working with many of the same partners. And so it helps us to think strategically about that. Um, I would also say that our size as a state has helped us build strong networks. And so I think the partners who have been uh, most responsive and most helpful through um, COVID-19 have been those that are, are part of networks across the state. Um, so, for example, our community action agencies, um, our food bank and food pantry network that all operate together as one network, um, our, our health equity zones. In all of those cases, there are examples of kind of pre-existing collaborative structures and routines that have been exercised over time. And so while they were stressed, because we were all stressed, um, the relationships have existed for decades in some cases, and so um, they weren't new and they didn't need to be built from scratch, which I think was really important. I want to follow that up. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I want to uh, just follow that up, and you can include this as, as well, is um, you had actually mentioned up front about your your mission um, to kind of set the stage for this conversation. Um, have you had to allow for elasticity in your mission during the pandemic, or have you found the opposite, um, that you really needed to lean into your defined mission? Can you add that into your, your comments as you continue answering uh, this question? Sure, I, I think um, it's an, an interesting question. You know, fundamentally DHS's mission is about equity and ensuring that all Rhode Islanders have an opportunity to thrive. And so I, I think where we have leaned in, it is in ensuring that the state's response is one that is equitable and that it reaches our most vulnerable populations. I think that's core to our work every day, but we've had an opportunity to push across the state's response to do that, um, which I think has been, has been really important. Um, it has also required us to think about how we work differently, like probably everyone on this call, but we couldn't stop operating for a day. You know, the department never closed. You could always access us, but we had to think about different paths of, and ways to access us um, to ensure that people had access to benefits. Um, and so that was something that happened, you know, we had to be able to pivot 
on a dime to think about how we kept our agency operating, um, which really, I think, forced us to get creative and challenged us to think about, you know, how we could do what we do without the four walls around us. Um, and I think is another example of something that will strengthen us moving forward. Caitlin, I'm just going to give you the opportunity if you have anything to add, and if not, I can sort of move on to the next question. No, I was just going to add, I think the director captured it beautifully. I would just add that there are, like the community partners, um, there are so many that have stepped up, um, and it has been remarkable to see those who have offered solutions to the problems that they're raising, right? And so. Um, I think the feedback loops that the director referenced earlier are certainly prevalent in our child care service systems, but in all of the programming that we administer through the department. Um, it's been really important for us to have feedback loops, but to also be able to raise and solicit suggestions for opportunities and solutions from our partners in addition to raising the barriers or perceived obstacles. Great. I want to. I, I don't, I'm not sure this fits under collaboration, but um, I'm going to put it here. So Rhode Island has very fluid borders in terms of people traveling um, in and out for work, for commerce, retail, doctors, everything else. And, and I feel like in a smaller city or a town across the country, they've got to be experiencing some of that same way. Sort of how do you control your borders while at the same time so many of the things that people access and do every day are across borders. So I'm wondering if either of you have thoughts about how did that potentially hurt um, Rhode Island, but also what, what ways did you spin that around to help um, and what could others maybe learn from some of that? Um, I'll try to stay non-controversial in this answer, Cindy, because our governor did get a, a, there was a fair amount of controversy at the beginning no. of the pandemic about our ability, our, our welcoming of people into the state and not. I, I think uh, two things. One, um, cross-state collaboration has been really important, and so I think it does fit with this idea of collaboration, and it's, I think what, what it has forced governors and their staffs to do is to put party aside um, and work together differently um, because it was very clear from the beginning that the New England states were going to be all in this together. Um, and so there have been, you know, chiefs of staff collaborative groups. There have been collaborative groups across departments like my own. Caitlin has been in daily conversation with Massachusetts and Connecticut about what how they were moving and what they were doing. And while we're not always in lockstep, because in some ways we kind of have different philosophies, um, we were able to, I think especially in the days of lockdowns, think about how we're working together. Um, and that's been really important. And we've done it with our municipal leaders as well. So uh, we the state has had at one point daily and now weekly calls with our municipal leaders to get feedback, to see what they're um, hearing and, and making sure that they have access to the resources that they need. Um, as, as, you know, we are a little bit unique because we don't have local public health departments, and so the state's role in um, preserving public health is even more paramount. Um, and we've had to think about how we take a statewide approach to public health and make sure that it's locally influenced by municipal leaders. And I, I think we've been largely successful in doing that. Can I uh, press you um, on this uh, concept of, of getting creative and um, have you been able to, to learn from and then apply in localities in Rhode Island case studies and examples of what others have done during this crisis? And if so, could you provide us an example of, of what you heard or saw others doing and how you then adapted that to your own work and your own geography? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I think um, I'll give the pandemic EBT as an example that this was a, a new program developed from scratch. And while we were the first to administer it, because in some ways we were technically more prepared, um, 
figuring out how to administer it was something that was done um, in consultation with all the New England states. At one point, I think we were doing daily calls um, with SNAP administrators and, and commissioners and directors of departments like mine um, to be able to um, determine how we were going to all of a sudden administer this program that had never existed. Um, I think in child care, you know, Rhode Island has largely led, um, but every decision that we have made, um, we would bring to the governor context about what every state has, you know, states that had gone before us, what they had done. I think an, a, another example that comes to mind about this is the um, provision of emergency child care, which has been an interesting experience for us. Um, when we closed child care, some other states remained open, some other states also closed, but had networks of child care providers for essential workers. And so we did a lot of studying what other states were doing um, and did develop a response that was largely consistent with those states. But what we saw locally is that we had much less of an uptake. Um, and so ultimately it was very underutilized and, and was not something that I think, I think if we have to go back to that, that again, our approach would be different. So that would be another example of where we learn from those around us um, and, and try to apply it locally. Sarah, I'm wondering if you can click a couple of slides ahead. I wanted to pull Nicole back in um, and, you know, have both Nicole and Caitlin ideally reflect a little bit on, on something that's been mentioned a couple of times um, and that I think folks who are listening today probably are very well aware of, which is across the country there's just real concern about how providers will survive survive all of this and adapt to meet needs. So, Nicole, I'm curious if you have thoughts, since you're so tuned into what's happening um, around the country and to these discussions, if there were things that particularly resonated with you that you heard that Rhode Island did that others might be able to learn from. And then Caitlin as well will put you in a position of, um, you know, if you could just say one or two things that everybody should be trying to get going today to try to stabilize providers, I think that could be super helpful to, for folks to hear. Thanks, Cindy. Um, appreciate it. Um, a couple of things. I think that one, um, if you recall, when we did the run through of resources that are allocated specifically for child care, those numbers should have been um, really um, astounding to folks in terms of um, the, how low they are, right? And so when the pandemic hit, uh, basically providers were already operating in a very fragile industry with a fragile ecosystem. So this notion that, you know, $3.5 billion was provided in initial support along with new proposals for 15 billion and 7 billion respectively, we don't know what that end number will be. That's across all 50 states. Um, and the majority of dollars that go into supporting the child care sector, direct child care dollars are pass through dollars, right? So federal dollars that get passed through to states. So I think that Rhode Island's um, approach has been really smart because the notion of bringing cross sector collaboration, but also leveraging different resources to help stabilize and support the sector has, is, is a really good approach that folks might want to think about looking at for best practice. We know, like I said, child care, the industry was fragile prior to the pandemic hitting, um, that most of the dollars are federal passive dollars, that providers are heavily dependent upon public operating subsidies to assist eligible families to cover the cost of care. Um, we also know that most child care providers are also small businesses, right? So you have this tension there between an industry um, that is not really the, the strongest um, small business structure in terms of the types of support that they're able to draw down given their very fragile um, operating revenues. And so this notion of being able to take the federal dollars that are out there to either leverage other sector investments or other um, entities in order to uh, stabilize the industry, I think it's very in in instructive. Um, and also viewing the many faces, Rhode Island is quite in, um, impressive 
in that it recognizes child care not only as early learning, not only as care for working families, but also as a proponent for the health, um, promoting healthy outcomes um, among children um, in, their, in their families. Kayla, I don't know if you have anything you want to add before we move on. No, I would just add that, I mean, those are really, you know, critical points that, you know, even pre-pandemic, we were really trying to work with our child care providers to think creatively about funding and being able to maximize both federal, state, and municipality investments to support early learning. Um, it was something that we tried to tackle um, in the context of expanding state pre-K, um, our high-quality pre-K program, um, and really thinking about a lot of the work that we did through the, pre the various preschool development grant awards that were provided to Rhode Island to sort of support increased availability of quality care. Um, what I think is unique is that during COVID, there has been certainly more flexibility and willingness from both providers and state agencies to think creatively about funding opportunities. Um, more, there's more funding, right? We, so we've been able to think about how to infuse that additional federal funding into opportunities that are already available that can support improved quality for children, the quality care for children. But then I think secondly, it's, you know, it's a crisis. And so people are willing to think differently about their investments in a way that they haven't been before. And so I think the combination of the two have really risen to, you know, unique opportunities for the child care community in Rhode Island. And it's also built a witness around the system in ways that we can network across those providers to build better efficiencies. And so PPE is the perfect example of where, you know, all providers are really reporting challenges in, in procuring PPE on initial reopening. Um, so we went down the path of sort of ordering and trying to purchase PPE on their behalf. But after we really dove into the data and did a lot of analysis on what their challenges were, we realized that it was just properly educating them on sort of the cadence or the, the frequency in which they were procuring the PPE. And so, and also making sort of a standardized list available of where they could access those materials. And so we developed kind of like a resource page for them online as to where they could access the materials and kind of what our guidance was in terms of frequency for ordering. And we found that to be really successful. And so while that is a very, you know, micro example of how we build efficiencies, but also, you know, thought creatively about resourcing, I think it's an important one because it's enabled providers to support one another and create a network in order to, you know, kind of do this work creatively and differently than what they've done before. That's great. Thank you. Shai, can I put you on the spot as we're getting close to the end here with a question to you, actually? Um, and Sarah, if you can click ahead one, that would be great. So, Shai, question to you with our National Director of Health and someone who thinks a lot about things like social determinants of health. One thing that struck me listening to the presentation is, um, you know, when Director Hawkins talked about health. She talked a lot about well-being and not so much the health of just going to the doctor, but of all the things that people need to stay well and healthy. And I'm wondering sort of your reflections on um, how small communities in particular could think about things a little bit differently and prioritize some of that in terms of even ways to help potentially reduce doctor visits or, or other thoughts you may have. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, Cindy, we're of the same mind here because I've been thinking about this as I've been listening to the presenters share their experience. And a few things I want to pitch into the pot here. Um, in general, I think this is really highlighting just how important focusing on the array of social determinants of health are in order to increase the health impact of all of the work that has been focused on. So whether or not it's childcare, as you can see, they're looping in the Department of Health and dealing with EPI and dealing with testing and uh, contact tracing, but also access to food, access to medical care. Um, and I, I also think that, and, and we might want to pivot back to the speakers in a moment, that um, 
this is very likely, and obviously I don't have the data to support this, but very likely reducing the burden on the medical system. Um, and, and most likely in small communities where there's less access or limited access to doctors and hospitals or where there have been closures of uh, family uh, clinics, um, this is so incredibly important. And the uh, whole health approach of the whole family approach um, is highlighting this. Um, I also want to note that um, I'm sure there are folks on the line across the country that are thinking that they don't have a health equity zone, but they do have other things that they've been working on over time. And I think it's important to note that um, in rural areas where you have folks wearing different hats and one person maybe three or four or five agencies, um, you don't have silos that you find across other state agencies or even in some municipalities where you don't have folks talking to one another because they have very distinctive and defined roles. Um, and not only that, you also have strong relationships because you're smaller and more intimate. Um, in addition, you have relationships with the state and across counties and regional partners. So I think it's important to think about what that structure of the health equity zone looks like in different scenarios that might be closer to your own um, and therefore you have ways that you're bringing folks together and then can leverage that um, in a similar way. So I'm going to chime in as a timekeeper here because we're winding down on our last minutes and we've just monitored the thread and it looks like we don't have any external questions um, yet at least, but a reminder to type those either into Q&A or chat if you do have any last minute questions. But in the couple of minutes we have remaining, I'm wondering, um, Director Hawkins and Caitlin, um, if you have any sort of last minute reflections that you want to share sort of out to the world, if you have a piece of advice to give to communities, what would that piece of advice be? Um, one, uh, Cindy, in, in preparing one question you had asked me was, where, where did we do well and where didn't we do well? And I think my answer to where we didn't do well is, and I think this is not unusual to most governments, is I can't believe how unprepared we were for something of this magnitude, and so we've scrambled a lot. And so as we as a state think, and I think as other municipalities think about preparation for disasters or pandemics or what have you, what I will take from this experience is the structure of it, whether it's a health equity zone or as Shay said, some other community infrastructure is thinking about that, that piece as part of your response plan who are the organizations, entities, credible messengers that are going to help communities who aren't reached by mainstream, typical disaster response? Who's going to get the message to them? Who's going to get food to them? Who's going to get resources to them? I think that's something that COVID-19 has really uh, shined a light on the importance of and something that we should all use in our planning for whatever the next, you know, potential challenge that we face is. And I don't think it costs a lot to invest in those structures, but I think we certainly benefited from the fact that we had invested in those infrastructures in the past um, and were able to start from there. And I think we're going, we intend to continue to do that as part of strengthening our response in the future. That's fantastic. Thank you. Caitlin, anything to add in the last minute before I turn it back over to Sarah to close us out today? Um, no, I would just, you know, only add that we had embarked upon some cross-agency governance work um, prior to COVID, but with the introduction of the pandemic, the need for cross-agency engagement among state government leads has just become even more critical. And I think one of the most meaningful 
opportunities that I've had during COVID-19 relief efforts is to be able to partner with our Department of Health and really understand the importance of, you know, prevention and proactive engagement in health equity. Um, and that is something that's always been on my mind, but in particular, COVID has just reinforced the importance of having that as a foundation to the policies in which we create and try and innovate on. And so, um, you know, I know that that is not news to the folks on this webinar, but it is, it is certainly something worth reinforcing to other community partners is that, you know, equity has always got to be at the foundation of the work that we're doing. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have so deeply engaged with so many of our colleagues at the Department of Education. Thank you. And thank you both so much um, for being here today. That was um, incredibly interesting and there's so much more we could ask you, but Sarah, I know we're at time, so I don't know if you have any parting words. No, I just wanted to re re reiterate what you said, Cindy, and, and say thanks again to all of our panelists today, including my colleagues at LISC and Director Hawkins and Caitlin uh, from the Rhode Island Department of Human Services. I think that was a really excellent um, presentation and discussion. I also just wanted to quickly remind everyone that the recording and the slides will be made available as soon as possible on the HUD exchange, so you can be on the lookout for them there. Um, but I think those are that's everything that I had to say. So if there's nothing else from the panelists, then I guess we'll, we'll give everybody back a minute of their time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you.